Test, test. Okay. Yikes. Good morning. And I decided that I have finally figured out that I do not need to uh, launch this broadcast exactly at your lecture time because it's online anyway. So uh, if you start at 9.30 your time, then you will be uh, a little bit behind where I'm at live, but that's okay. If you have any questions or comments or, you know, crazy idea uh, interactions that you would like to do, uh, that can be done through the YouTube comments, but that's out in the, you know, wild, wild west there in comment land. Or you can use the Canvas discussion that I just published. So I'm going to go ahead and start a little bit early because uh, I'm going to catch lunch with my boys at their school. And today it's going to be Subway. I talked them out of McDonald's because that was getting um, old. Even just once a week, that was going to be too much. Anyway, where we left off last time was with replica plating. And I kind of went on about how enthused I am about having done it before. But it is fun. But it works. That's the most important part of the method. And this is something that's a method that was probably developed in the 60s-ish uh, or earlier. And it's something that's still useful now. And it definitely is something that you could do if you wanted to go DIY with a lot of these experiments. Like a lot of old school biology is. It's doable uh, on your own if you wanted. So the Ames test, this is a way, and there's, uh, there's a problem with how this is being applied in some cases right now. But anyway, here's what this test is. So you take and you add some rat liver extract. And here's your, you're adding salmonella and you're adding a mutant. Um, yeah, that requires histidine. So you can plate and incubate both the samples using the medium uh, lacking histidine. So normally this shouldn't grow or like not many. There shouldn't be very many uh, what are called reversion mutants. That's when you have a mutation that uh, confers a deficiency to the organism that is able to revert back to its wild type form. Now that happens at a certain rate um, spontaneously without any extra inputs. But the idea here is that when you have the mutagen introduced as well, and, and it's the background of this rat liver extract, uh, that uh, the mutagen, uh, if it's able to cause uh, this, revert and this uh, reversion, and uh, if it's a mutagen, there should be more reversions, more, 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 reverse, more reversion events resulting in more revertance. And that's what's still being applied now uh, to call things mutagenic and um, well there's a whole other discussion about whether or not it's it's applicable in every case oops okay so that brings us into section six which is about um, how asexual prokaryotes achieve genetic diversity so the learning objectives here include to um, well, I'm going to tell you things about transformation, transduction, and conjugation, and therefore you should be able to compare them. Explain how asexual gene transfer results in prokaryotic genetic diversity and the structure and consequences for bacterial genetic diversity of transposons. Okay. So horizontal gene transfer, HGT, is one of the most basic ways that uh, prokaryotes will share new metabolic capacities between cells. And uh, this is carried out, well, okay, that's not the only way. That's conjugation. Um, but all these other ways are also horizontal gene transfer. Uh, you know, you have, we have transformation, which is uh, plasmid-mediated, but it's through uh, the uptake of naked DNA. And I'm going to describe that in more detail momentarily. And then transduction, which is uh, bacteriophage-mediated. And then conjugation. Uh, much of the antibiotic resistance we uh, enjoy in our pathogens out there is the result of conjugation events because that's a uh, bacterial sex. You have a, a plasmid that's able to uh, cause the creation of a sex pillus that is able to bridge two cells together long enough to make at least one copy of that plasmid. Well, that's the overview. I'm going to go over it in slightly more detail. 
Now the naked uptake of DNA uh, from the environment is a very rare event relatively. So when you're doing molecular cloning, uh, you have to rely on using large numbers of cells and large numbers of plasmids carrying your piece of DNA of interest. And um, you also have to treat the cells a certain way so that they're more likely to take up naked DNA. And it's the next chapter that will walk through that process because some of you are going to be doing it and uh, it is still a very standard uh, tool that we use in the molecular biology lab, uh, molecular cloning is. The transduction is still used as well and then conjugation is something we could test. Maybe we'll do that. Um, when I arrange our tour of the wastewater treatment plant, we should go ahead and collect some uh, primary influent water if we don't want to do oxidation ditch. Either way, uh, it doesn't matter, but primary influent would be more indicative of the uh, bacterial load that's coming in, you know, from all the poop water uh, directly into the treatment plant. So from that, uh, when I tested it in the past, the fecal coliforms that were present in the wastewater influent, uh, over 90 percent of them by the time I left uh, TAing when I was getting my master's there at Murray the um, over 95 percent of the fecal coliforms that we sampled were already resistant to ampicillin that was already in the environment now the first year I had been doing that as an undergrad TA the percentage was lower uh, it was down around 80 ish percent but that's still really high right in fact I was afraid with my little enterococcus adventure that it would be ampicillin resistant because that's the antibiotic I'm on. Now, that's a good choice for an antibiotic for a gram positive, right? But um, that beta lactamase gene, it is all over out there in the environment. Even in the creeks around Murray, I can find uh, ampicillin resistant fecal coliforms that are more numerous than is recommended for even recreational water play. So that's not even counting the total coliforms, like in the uh, all the streams connected to Clark's River where people like to go, um, what's the term for that? I thought there was a separate term. It's not just budding, but they ride their four wheelers down the creeks, you know, all day long. And that looks kind of like fun, um, I guess, but, uh, all the water they're doing that in is, um, uh, very contaminated with fecal coliforms that are already resistant to ampicillin. So being in that water long enough, if you get some of that, uh, bacteria that is already amp resistant, that, gets up the wrong hole, there you've got a UTI that you can't treat with ampicillin already. Now the Kentucky Lake, however, though it's been a long time since we tested it, uh, Kentucky Lake doesn't have that level of fecal coliform contamination at all. Not the, not what the creeks have around uh, Callaway, Graves County. Uh, they have a lot more. Anyway, more details on transformation. So again, this is the uptake of naked DNA and uh, while there are many uh, bacteria that are naturally competent that will take up environmental DNA, uh, most of the time when they do that, they just chop it up and recycle the nucleotides, right? But if they don't, that single-stranded, any single-stranded DNA that's surviving uh, has the opportunity to recombine with the genome. And, uh, but this natural transformation is, is very inefficient because usually you're just eating that. Um, and then available DNA in the environment isn't exactly, um, it doesn't stay available very long. It's generally food. And of course that recombination is inefficient because it doesn't have anywhere uh, specific. Uh, it has to, by random chance, have sufficient homology to uh, be able to recombine with the genome. So transduction, this is virus mediated. So this is phage, bacteriophage mediated. So you have your original cell bopping along it gets injected with the phage dna and then the phage dna will um you know take over host machinery uh we're in the lytic cycle here so we're breaking down uh, the host dna and then the cell will create the new phages now some of the phages will include some host dna in there so after lysis this um and so in this cartoon, we've got like one that's got host DNA in it that's been improperly packaged. Say that one lands on another cell, it injects its DNA. Uh, now you have uh, DNA that came from the, uh, a different 
bacterial chromosome gets introduced and um, will in undergo transduction and be integrated into the new host's chromosome. And that's by a recombination. So that's transduction. Now transformation we leverage the crap out of in the lab. Transduction you can do uh, still uh, for packaging large bacterial chromosomes, but we have, uh, so we're still calling them next gen sequencing methods as far as I know, but um, they're aging, they're hitting a decade, uh, you know, 10 years old now. But uh, you used to do a lot of transduction to make libraries. Uh, so you could basically have your chromosomes covered by overlapping segments that are represented in phage DNA. Um, yeah, anyway. So conjugation. Uh, this is a lot more prevalent uh, in the environment. And the basic process is that you have your fertility plus the F stands for fertility. So you have an F plasmid uh, present here. A pilus is formed to the F minus cell by rolling copy replication. There is a, uh, a copy of the plasmid that is made and transported to the recipient cell. And now you have two fertil fertility plus cells, fertility positive cells. So now this new cell is able to share copies of that plasmid with, um, with other cells. And then of course it's made double stranded, uh, you know, replication will, we transfer the single stranded uh, rolling copy off of there. And then, yeah, anyway. So um, sometimes you have uh, what are called high frequency of recombination cells. That's HFR cells, where you have your F plasmid that becomes integrated into the host chromosome. And that makes it an HFR male, a donor. And uh, so, yeah, the HFR cell. So the, um, when this gets excised, again, as a plasmid, uh, it, it could carry something from the bacterial chromosome. This, this excision is not going to be necessarily precise. And so in this case, um, we're carrying lack over. Oops. But yeah, so these are HFR cells. Uh, and then here's a plasmid that's picked up a new gene. And now uh, any F minus cells this encounters and forms a pillus with, it will transfer that newly modified plasmid with this new capacity. Now, sometimes we could transfer the entire bacterial chromosome, uh, but generally this doesn't, you don't get the uh, entire chromosome transferred because this conjugation is for a limited time only, the sex pillus connection. And uh, yeah, it takes time for it to be transferred. Um, but yeah, we can use that to make a map of the bacterial chromosome. But again, we have these um, next gen sequencing methods that kind of eliminates the need to do that kind of thing anymore. So transposition, so transposons, segments of DNA that have the ability to move from one location to another because they code for the enzyme transposase. So in this example, we have a non-replicative transposon that has disrupted uh, this gene here, gene B. And now, you know, whatever happens there, it's gonna happen because gene B was disrupted. So here's the transposon. Uh, <clears throat> it's characterized by these inverted repeat sequences on the upflank and the downflank side of the, um, that it's part of the transposon, but they, they flank the transposase gene because these are the recognition sites for the transposases, for the transposase are these inverted repeat sequences. So that's transposition, yes. Okay, so the mechanisms, the summary, mechanisms of genetic diversity in prokaryotes, we have our conjugation, which is probably the um, most common by far and uh, we have transduction 
That's where we are mediated through uh, transfer mediated by bacteriophage transformation, naked DNA, more rare. And then we have transposition where the DNA can independently excise from one location and integrate elsewhere. Okay. So that brings us into gene regulation operon theory. Where are we at on time? I think we're we are fine, right? Yeah. Okay, good. So operon theory, uh, I'll tell you a little something about this is uh, this is something that you'll probably be asked, especially if you're going into molecular biology um, or biochemistry or whatever graduate program that you're going into that's on the PhD side, uh, for sure, you'll be asked to repeat, uh, you know, an example of different types of uh, gene regulation and operon theory will be one of them. And the most common is, of course, talking about the lac operon and the trip operon. So here we are going to compare inducible operons and repressible operons and describe why regulation of operons is important. I, if I'm doing this again, I'm going to, whatever. Um, Regulation, uh, why regulation of operons is important should be self-evident, I hope, in that um, you conserve resources and you're able to respond to uh, changing environmental conditions, right? You know, just making enzymes that aren't going to be useful, um, you know, you're, you're uh, conserving your energy and using your resources more wisely. That's why regulation of operons is important. Okay, so the operon, as I indicated before, uh, will tend to have a series of structural genes all together. And then there will be a promoter and an operator. And um, so on the board, I sketched it where the operator was in the promoter. And that's, um, that's sort of how it winds up working physically, because you can have an operator um, that will bind something, that was a regulatory element, that will block the promoter, for example. But then somewhere else, uh, you tend to have regulatory genes. And depending upon the nature of the operon, oh well, I'll, I'll get to that, right? So we have these structural genes of related function organized together on the genome, uh, transcribed under the control of a single promoter. This makes sense because all these structural genes are required for whatever metabolic capacity this represents. So you need all the genes or it's not going to work anyway. So um, the uh, repressor, if repressor binds to the operator, uh, the structural genes will not be transcribed. Alternatively, we could have activators that bind to the regulatory region that will enhance transcription. Depends on the nature of the operon. Okay. So a bunch of text about these things. So transcription factors. Uh, these are proteins encoded by regulatory genes that influence transcription. That's straightforward, right? Uh, they can be a repressor, and that's one that will suppress transcription. And then in general, that's because it binds the operator, and it's in response to external stimulus. And then our, or, or our transcription factor could be an activator, and that will increase transcription. And generally, this is accomplished by facilitating RNA polymerase binding. So we can have an inducer, and that's a molecule that activates or represses transcription uh, interaction with activator or depending on how it interacts. So you're either inducing uh, activation or inducing repression. Now, constitutive, I think I mentioned that before, uh, constitutive means uh, that expression of that operon. Okay, well, okay, I didn't mention the context of operons, but in the, in the um, context of eukaryotic genes. So constitutive operons are um, continuously expressed. They're non-regulated. They just, um, you know, these are things that are fundamental for, for, for all kinds of activity. And then if you're not constitutive, you're inducible. So if your expression is controlled by repressors, activators, inducers, um, you're inducible. Now, if you're negative inducible, 
Repressor is normally bound to the operator, and lack operon is an example of this. And that's the kind of thing you'll be asked to write about at some point. Uh, not in here, but uh, it's something you might want to familiarize yourself with. So it's negative induced. So the normal state of the operator is uh, bound by repressor. Okay, so if we have a negative repressible, that's when the repressor only binds operator with a co-repressor is an example of that. And that's the trip operon, tryptophan, uh, which I will talk about as well. And then if you're positive inducible, the activator is normally unbound. Uh, it needs an inducer to activate. And if you're positive repressible, activator normally is bound. And the inhibitor forces release. But yeah, most of the time you're going to be asked about the lac operon and the trip operon. Okay, so lac operon. We're looking at a negative, an, an example of a negative inducible operon. So, and this also has another feature um, around the way glucose is monitored, which I will also tell you about. All right, so lac ZYA are the structural genes required to uh, transport lactose into the cell and you know do stuff to it so if there's no lactose in your environment and you're a little bacteria out there trying to make its way in the world and there's no there's no lactose available then you don't need to be uh, transcribing this uh, this operon at all so you have a repressor and uh, this repressor will block uh, the RNA polymerase. So the RNA polymerase may be combined to the promoter, but it'll be stalled out and it will subsequently fall off. If lactose is present, uh, particularly allolactose, uh, the form of lactose that will bind to this repressor, um, you will bind to the repressor and the repressor will lose affinity for the operator and um, drift away. So now, it is possible to transcribe this operon. So in the presence of lactose, you can transcribe it because you probably need to be processing it as it is available as a carbon source for you. Right, okay. So that's negative inducible, right? So remember negative inducible, repressor is normally bound to the operator. And that's what the case we have here. When you have the inducer, uh, present, you're able to relieve the repression of the operator. Now, another aspect of the operation of, of the lac operon relates to glucose levels. And glucose levels, so when ATP levels decrease, um, which they will do when glucose is depleted, some of the remaining ATP is converted by adenylcyclase uh, to cyclic AMP. So the increase in cyclic AMP signals glucose depletion. So that's important to the next step. And that's uh, the lac operon as an example of catabolite repression. So in the absence of cyclic AMP, this uh, catabolite, here we go, catabolite activator protein, that's what CAP is. CAP will not bind the promoter and transcription will occur, uh, but at a low rate. Now this is, um, do I want to mention that? So the, yeah, I, I do, I do, because it's important. Uh, note that here in these cartoons, the, um, the repressor is missing, right? So since the repressor is missing, that must mean lactose is present or the repressor is gone, um, which is a different thing entirely. And in this example, um, the repressor is present. All right, so in, the, in these three conditions, um, we have lactose is present out there in the world uh, for this critter in this cell. All right, so if we don't have any cyclic AMP, CAP will not bind to the promoter. Uh, transcription does occur uh, because we have uh, lactose present, but at a low rate. Now, if we have uh, cyclic AMP indicating our glucose level is low, then CAP uh, and bound to cyclic AMP will uh, increase transcription rate uh, dramatically. And so here's 
yeah, yeah. So that's the both conditions there. All right, so we have um, low glucose and we have lactose present. So uh, we have a lot of RNA synthesis here. But again, if we have uh, the cyclic AMP, so we have low glucose and we have, um, but we don't have lactose, then the repressor will still block the operator and transcription can't take place. Okay, so um, a little review. Again, so the glucose re repression here, uh, we have our ATP that will convert, be converted to cyclic AMP by adenocyclase. Now this adenocyclase, this was important here, is inhibited by high extracellular glucose. So it won't be making camp if there's a lot of extracellular glucose. So outside the cell, high glucose, inactive adenocyclase, low cyclic AMP, CAP does not bind to DNA, resulting in infrequent transcription of the lycoperon. If there's low glucose, adenocyclase is active, resulting in high cyclic AMP concentrations, making a lot of cyclic AMP available to bind with CAP, and that will induce frequent transcription of lacoperon, provided the repressor is gone. So we'll recap over all the conditions here. If we have glucose, so here's these two conditions, we do have glucose present, therefore no CAP binding. If we have no lactose, the repressor is bound, resulting in no transcription. Same starting situation. We have glucose, so CAP does not bind, but we have lactose available. Uh, the repressor is not binding. We'll have a basal, called basal level transcription. So some transcription will happen. Low glucose, low glucose conditions here. A cap will bind in both cases. If we don't have lactose, we still have repressor, so we can't transcribe anything here, this operon. If we uh, do have lactose, however, we will relieve repression and we will get transcription uh, here in the lac operon. Okay. And when you look at this, um, a growth curve over time. Glucose obviously is the preferred substrate. And uh, if you look at the slope of this line, just eyeball it uh, compared to, oh, I can't eyeball it. <laughs> uh, the slope of this line is steeper than this line. I think we can see that uh, pretty clearly. And uh, that's because glucose will grow uh, better, uh, faster using uh, its preferred substrate there. And now when glucose is depleted, right about here, we have to switch over and make the genes required to transport and manipulate lactose. And then we resume a growth rate that's lower than that with glucose alone or with glucose present already. Okay, tryptophan, repressible operator. This has fun multiple levels of, of control. Okay, so tryptophan, the operon, requires, uh, let's see, we have five structural genes required to make tryptophan. If we have no tryptophan present, the repressor will dissociate because it requires tryptophan, see the other part of the cartoon. If there's tryptophan present in sufficient quantities to bind a sufficient repressor, then we will uh, block the operator because we obviously don't need any more because we already have it. So it's like a feedback. Well, it is a feedback system, right? If we don't have sufficient tryptophan for that, then the repressor will not bind the operator. So transcription will be able to take place. That's part of it. Oops. And again, if we have tryptophan, we block it. All right. So here we go. So negative control of the trip operon. With no tryptophan, we don't have the repressor. We have the inactive APO repressor. So the trip R is the gene that codes for the repressor. And the APO repressor monomer will dimerize, but it, it can't bind uh, the operator. And then we're able to make 
um, we're able to make the RNA and then we're able to make the protein right right off of that. All right, so if the APO repressor binds tryptophan, it changes conformation, gains a high affinity for the trip operon. There's the cartoon here. See, their little knobbies are pointed away and now they're pointed straight up. They're able to bind the operator. So tryptophan is the co-repressor. Here's the point here. Oh, there's more. Oh, wait. Okay. We're coming back to the trip operon. But right now, remember, we're, we have negative control of it. It's a repressible operon. It does not start out repressed. It has to be repressed with the uh, co-repressor tryptophan. All right. So um, in prokaryotes in general, there are a group of, well, here, small internuclear nucleotide derivatives um, that are called alarmones. Sometimes the names make me want to wince a little bit. But, I mean, it tells you what it does, at least. It's like a hormone. It's like a signal, and it's got alarm on the front, right? So, alarmones. Okay. But these will induce changes in gene expression um, to stimulate a stress response. Now, uh, here we have alternative sigma factors, which I mentioned before in, re in respect to the, um, you know, how... Uh, transcription works in prokaryotes you know you require sigma factors so here are some various sigma factors that are alternatives um, these are all identified in Escherichia coli so I mentioned 54 before that's for nitrogen starvation we have um, sigma 19 involved in iron transport so iron is a resource uh, that is scavenged most um, uh, diligently in our environment particularly like in ocean environments you don't have a lot of iron available so sigma 24 uh, heat stress and then if it gets really bad you have sigma 32 for heat shock and uh, sigma 38 signaling stationary phase or, or starvation all right so ribo switches this is important to mention uh, especially for the next part of trip uh, trip operon regulation so we have uh, riboswitches. So in prokaryotic messenger, remember our single-stranded RNA. One of the things it's really good at is forming internal structure uh, within the same molecule. So here we have um, the ability to stabilize certain structures. So here's the riboswitch. So here, these are homologous, so they're able to bind with themselves. Um, if the gene is on, you have this, what's called the anti-terminator stem loop gets formed. And so the anti-terminator, uh, it means that the transcription will be able to proceed. And so then, um, but if you have a, here's a small molecule that will interact with the riboswitch, it will cause a change in the conformation, making this portion available to form a stem loop structure with, uh, you know, another part of the promoter here. So we've got a terminator stem loop. This turns off transcription of this gene in, in both cases here. So, so we we're showing you the ribosome. So, you know, in transcription and in translation. So the riboswitch uh, can happen in DNA, see, and in RNA. Wait, that's the DNA. That's the messenger RNA. It happens in the RNA, right? But a transcription and translation is what I'm trying to say. So the ribosome binding site versus, um, yeah, we can knock the RNA polymerase off. So attenuation in the trip operon. All right, so here we have our messenger RNA. We have our start codon. We have the ribosome assembled around it. Uh, and then we have the trip L. Um, so we have one or two fates here. If we are in the termination conformation, what happens is that we have segments three and four will form the uh, terminator stem loop. causing transcription to terminate. And then uh, here, 
All right, sorry. Let me just read this. Uh, so we see. Um, so we have lots of tryptophan. So we don't really need more tryptophan. The short leader peptide encoded by trip L proceeds. The terminator loop between region three and four forms and transcription terminates. So this is with lots of tryptophan. When tryptophan levels are depleted, translation of the short leader peptide stalls at region one, right here, allowing regions two and three to form an anti-terminator loop. And then the RNA polymerase can transcribe the structural genes of the trip operon. Okay. So let me go through this again. We have the ribosome, we have the RNA polymerase, because prokaryotes, this can happen at the same time. We have the short leader peptide by trip L. So three and four, the terminator stem loop is formed. There's trip L causing the RNA polymerase to fall off. Well, in transcription, yeah, terminate. When transcription proceeds, if the ribosome gets stalled, oh, the ribosome's going, <laughs> sorry, I, I'm sorry. I forgot about this part <laughs> before. All right, so um, essentially, um, the ribosome's knocking this off. But if you stall the ribosome, there's time for the anti-terminator stem loop to form, allowing transcription to proceed. That's during low levels of tryptophan. So we're, we're stalled out here because we're, we're, we're missing tryptophan. And we're not stalled out up here because we have tryptophan. And since it doesn't stall at one, it's able to proceed. So the two, three anti-terminator stem loop is unable to form. causing the polymerase to get knocked off ultimately. There we go. So it's based on whether or not we already have tryptophan present because we're making this little leader peptide here uh, that we require it for. Okay. Now in eukaryotes, uh, we have these enhancer sequences that I believe I've mentioned before, but uh, here's a cartoon of it in a little more detail. So this can be a thousand base pairs away or whatever. It's probably at least 100, 150 base pairs of upstream of the promoter. And you have these distal control elements that have to interact uh, with various transcription. So at this level, we can say various transcription factors. Later on, uh, you'll have to talk about what those transcription factors actually are. All right, so activators bound to the distal control elements interact with mediator proteins and transcription factors. Uh, two different genes may have the same promoter, but different distal control elements, enabling differential gene expression. Resolution of the clinical focus. All right, Mark survived his bout with necrotizing fasciitis. He now needs to undergo uh, skin grafting, and uh, it's unlikely his leg will regain uh, full strength. Group A strep. Here we go. So that's one of the reportable organisms, which we'll go over later on in another chapter. And uh, yeah, so they analyzed uh, the group, the strep isolated from him uh, for methicillin resistance. And that is, uh, so it's genetically encoded, becoming more common in group A strep through horizontal gene transfer, as I mentioned uh, previously. And let's see, in necrotizing fasciitis, blood flow to the infected area is typically limited because of the action of various genetically encoded bacterial toxins, while there's typically little to no bleeding. Uh, limit the effect of their mass. Uh, anyway, uh, he lived, and his leg may not recover, but there it is. All right, so that's the end of uh, this chapter. This is chapter 11. And um, yeah, so I should make the assignment available soon. And I'll see you on Wednesday. All right. Have fun.